Hello, hello. So as you can see, going through Luke 3, I'm going to have another chart in front of me. There is some setup work that I need to do on the front side of Luke 3 to get us to where we need to be to understand years and dates. And this is an excellent, probably one of the most excellent sources of double checking that we can do is with the information presented in Luke 3. This is why I do my very, very best to study the whole Bible and not just specific topics because we can have what we think are plausible scenarios or good ideas until we're blue in the face. But the more we branch out and the more information we come across, it has to double check itself. So we're going to start. And for you guys who have not seen this before, this is a chart that I have available in the link below on academia.edu. It's entitled Biblical Events Overlaying World History. And this is the culmination of the entirety of my research from start to finish. It has everything on here that you would be able to cross-reference in the Bible as pertinent to the beginning of days and the end times. It is literally the entire overview of world history. How many years there are in world history, how we derive that, uh, types and shadows, and direct information besides. So this is kind of like the end-all be-all of my research. <laughs> and uh, I'm quite uh, proud that I could put it out, but it does have a significant amount of explanation that goes alongside it. For the purpose of this video, we're going to start with the reign of Artaxerxes, the first one, Germanus, because this relates to the first period of uh, the first period given of Daniel's 70 weeks. Daniel's 70 weeks is the pivotal, seminal, end times prophecy. There is one outstanding period of seven, and if you guys have been following along in my written study of the revelation of Jesus Christ, you will know that I literally just got to that point in Revelation 6 to discuss the 70th week of Daniel. But there's a prophecy given in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 that says, no, um, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So we are given a first period of time which equates to 69 of the 70 weeks. We're given a starting point, which happens to be in Nehemiah 2, which places us in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes in the month Nisan. And from that point, there will be 69 periods of seven, which is unto the Messiah, the Prince. Now, the one thing that we have to understand about this prophecy, this whole 70 weeks prophecy, and we learn this more from understanding the 70th week of which, which um, half of it is discussed in Daniel 12. And it's also discussed in Revelation that each half of it, uh, respective to the two witnesses in the first half, 1260 days is their time to prophesy. And the second half, which again is, is correlative to Daniel 12, but from the midpoint, the abomination of desolation, unto the end, there's another 1260 days. So you have a period of seven years. So I'll, I'll continue um, going through the prophecy. But when we get to that end period of weeks, that outstanding 70th week of years, we understand from Daniel and Revelation that it is one period of seven that is equal to 2,520 days. That is only possible on a 360 day calendar. So in order to understand precisely, not about, but precisely from point A to point B, you have to convert it to a 360 day year count, which gives you 173,880 days. When you plot that back on our modern Gregorian calendar, which you can see that I've used throughout, 
Our days are not 360 per year. They are 365 and or 366 in leap years. So it's not going to be a direct 483 year correlation. It actually is 476, which is why it looks like we're short seven years because the conversion to the type of calendar that Daniel's prophecy requires use of is not one we presently use. So you can't just say, oh, 69 periods of seven is 483 years. So there's going to be 483 years between point A and point B. No, there are not. Because again, that prophecy uses by virtue of our understanding that we gain from the 70th week in Revelation and Daniel uses 360 day years. So in order to understand properly and precisely, we're all about precision here, precision and accuracy. You must convert the first 69 weeks of years to 360 day years, which gives you a total day count that you then place into the starting point and add to get to an ending point, which brings you to 32 AD. So hopefully I didn't just confuse you, but I'm going to guess that those of you who are familiar with this prophecy are probably not confused. Precision. I cannot emphasize precision enough. And as we go through Luke 3, you will understand why we must be precise about this. So, going back to Daniel 9, talking about the reign of Artaxerxes and Nehemiah. So, uh, he says, from, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Nehemiah 2, unto the Messiah the Prince, Matthew 21, there shall be three, uh, and this is also Luke 19 since we're in the book of Luke. It's Luke 19 in Luke's gospel. Matthew 21 in Matthew's gospel and Luke 19 in Luke's gospel. Uh, there shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times relating to Nehemiah. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's talking about 70 AD. The end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. The first desolation was of the city and the temple, where one stone was not left upon another that would not be thrown down. 70 AD. And the second desolation of which is in the midpoint of the 70th week. There's no destruction, there's simply a flight and a desolation of the city and of the temple by Israel. Uh, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is the outstanding period of seven that begins in Revelation 6. Uh, so after um, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So this is pertinent to the 70 weeks prophecy because we have a point at which unto the Messiah the Prince, which tells us when Jesus was going to present the kingdom to Israel the first time and they rejected it. This is Palm Sunday. So we go to the historical calendar and we get the reignal years of Artaxerxes I Longimanus. He started his reign in August 11th of 465 BC. Now again, we go back to the importance of precision. When we go to the month Nisan, or excuse me, when we go to Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 2, we have two events that are in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. One is in Kislev, which answers to our December, and the other is in Nisan, which would answer to our March-April. And the only way that it would be possible for them to both be in the 20th year of Artaxerxes is if he's working from a fall to fall calendar. And yes, the Persian renal years are from fall to fall, which would mean that December and March would both be in his same 20th year reign precision. <laughs> so if he begins fall of 465 BC, his 20th year would be 446 to 445 because again we're in BC so we're counting down toward AD. So you have Kislev from Nisan uh, from Nehemiah 1 that is in his 20th year which would answer to December-ish 446 BC and Nehemiah 2 the start of the first 69 weeks of years in 445 BC, Nisan, answers to March or April. So this is the beginning of the 70 weeks of years. And we understand that there's going to be an end point after the first 69 when Jesus brings the kingdom to Israel the first time and they reject it. 
the unto the Messiah, the Prince. So again, we go back to our day count, understanding that we need to convert for the purpose of integrating it into our calendar. So uh, 69 periods of seven, 69 times seven times 360 is a day count of 173,880. When you count that many days from the month Nisan, it would be Nisan 10 of 445 BC, you get to Nisan 1032 AD, which again is Palm Sunday. It's not 483 years, it's 476 because you must drill down into the day counts. This is entirely important. So, uh, and just as a side note, the reason that Daniel called out seven weeks and three score and two weeks in his prophecy is because he's directing you to use the weeks of years or the periods of sevens, the Shabuas that were established in Leviticus 25. There is a specific legal command given in Leviticus 25, 8 to number seven Sabbaths of years, a space of 49 years. That is what Daniel is telling you to do. And by virtue of calling out seven weeks, he's numbering seven Sabbaths of years. It's not that they are not consecutive. They are. It's simply that he's telling you that his weeks of years will all have the same beginning point as was uh, commanded to start the count when Israel came into the land in Leviticus 25. All of Daniel's weeks of years have a Nisan 10 start date because they're predicated upon the Sabbaths that began to be counted when Israel came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho in Joshua 419. So in the month Nisan, we're not told Nisan 10. We would expect it to be Nisan 10 by virtue of the fact that it is the beginning of a week of years, which all have Nisan 10 start dates. And unto the Messiah, the Prince, Nisan 10, triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. So these fit with our expectations. Thus, the 70th week of years will also have Nisan 10 to Nisan 10 start and end dates because it is a week of years. In Daniel's prophecy, they're all going to be weeks of years, which are predicated upon the one-time entry uh, point of Israel into the promised land, Nisan 10, 1406 ish BC. So, Nisan 10, 445, we use our day count to get to the end, which is Nisan 1032 AD, unto the Messiah, the Prince. Not only did Israel have Daniel's prophecy to tell them which day was in view for the triumphal entry or the kingdom presentation, they also had. The Zechariah 9 prophecy, which says, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, lowly and meek, riding the colt, the foal of a donkey. So we use our red arrow to come to Jesus, the life of Jesus, Jesus' ministry. And we have the triumphal entry on Nisan 1032 AD. Now, we know that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. We should know this anyway. So we can assert very assuredly that if we count back three and a half years, Jesus's ministry would begin on Tishri 10, 28 AD. Tishri 10 is extraordinarily important and we're going to get to this when we look into Luke 4 to understand why his ministry began on the Day of Atonement and the legal, uh, the legal implications of that. When I say legal implications, I mean there are specific things from the law that point to Jesus fulfilling them. Remember that the law is a foreshadow of the body of Christ. So the implication of Jesus beginning his ministry on the Day of Atonement is significant. Luke 4 is where we will have that discussion. However, this is where I say that Luke has a very big double check system built into it. And we're going to discuss two different, actually three different ways where that is built into, uh, where double checks are built into Luke 3 for the purpose of understanding the timeline of the end times and end times prophecy. Now, uh, for this specific point, we're going to look at this chart here, the reign of Tiberius, which is respected to Luke 3, 1 through 3. So this is where we're going to begin our journey through the book of Luke. Uh, excuse me, the, the chapter of Luke 3. <laughs> uh, it's actually not... A very long chapter and the amount of information that doesn't specifically relate to genealogy there is a genealogy in here uh, but this is actually quite information heavy so let's go to the book of Luke having understood these things and we're going to back up from the the end of Jesus's ministry and the year in which that occurred and how we can know that because of everything I just discussed 
So we're going to back up and we're going to double check our work based on the information in Luke. So three and a half years from Nisan 1032 AD, we back up to Tishri 1028 AD. Would 28 AD have been accurate? Well, let's uh, get to our double checks. Luke 3, 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iutreia and then the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias and the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Now, in case you guys missed it, we spent Luke 1 talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist respective to Christ. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. So the pinpoint that we're going to be given to the beginning of John's ministry is important in understanding that he would have begun six months before Jesus began his ministry. This information was given in Luke 3.1, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So it's giving you uh, in the 15th year of his reign, and there's other reigns besides, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So John the Baptist began his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. So Jesus would have begun his ministry six months after John the Baptist began his, which may or may not still have been in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. What is important is to note that John began his being six months older than Jesus in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. So Tiberius, when we go to the historical record, began to reign in 14 AD. That puts the 15th year of his reign in 28 AD. Now Jesus began his ministry in Tishri 10 of 28 AD. John the Baptist, being six months older, would have began his ministry in the month Nisan of 28 AD. So I don't know specifically how the Romans reckoned their calendar, whether it was fall to fall or spring to spring. Doesn't really matter because at this precise point, John the Baptist would have begun his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius' reign. So whether it would have still been in the 15th year when Jesus began his doesn't matter. John the Baptist would have began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius' reign, which would have been Nisan of 28 AD. So Jesus, six months later, would have begun his ministry in Tishri of 28 AD. And thus we have the first of our double checks. So for those who would suggest that the information here pertaining to Artaxerxes Longimanus and the first, uh, excuse me, the beginning and the end of the first 69 weeks of years are anything other than this here, are an error. And the way that we can very easily say that is with the double check that is given. The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius is only going to be one year. And John the Baptist was only born in one year, in one month of the year, and Jesus began his ministry six months later, which had to end in Nisan 10 of 32 AD. So I understand that there is a great amount of information and a great amount of opinion out there. But when we're talking about these as one-time events and we use precision day counts to get to our information, there's only going to be one way this is going to work. So Jesus ended his ministry on Nisan 10 of 32 AD, and he began his ministry on Tishri 10 of 28 AD. And the way that we can ascertain this very, very precisely and correctly is through Tiberius and John the Baptist respected to Jesus, which is information we gain in Luke 1. That's why I say Luke is the double check to end all double check systems about the timeline of prophecy and specifically the life of Jesus. Now, when we continue, so we're not going to pay attention to Jesus' age right now, but what I do have here, uh, I'm going to move this over because we're going to Focus on this part right here. So hopefully you guys can see this clearly. If you don't want to pay attention to his age, which is what I have in this column, then don't. 
but pay attention to the BC AD years because this is going to come into play. So I have Jesus's age and the BC AD years, and I also have the division of Tishri and Nisan because that is going to be important for what we're going to talk about. So uh, you might need to spend a little bit of time just looking over this to see what I've got here, but it does have BC AD years and it does have Jesus's age and it does have Nisan and Tishri um, six month or I guess it, it's got divisions of the year based on Nisan and Tishri. So we're going to work from the back to Jesus's birth, which just happened in Luke 2. <clears throat> now. When we go back to Luke 3, there is a continued prophecy of John the Baptist fulfilling when he began his ministry, words that were written by the prophet Isaiah. So as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see, shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry right here with his baptism. And again, there are significant implications to this regarding points of law from the Old Covenant that we're going to talk more fully about when we get to Luke 4. So I might backtrack a little bit uh, to this part in Luke 3, but I don't want to bring in too much information into this conversation in this video just yet. However, the beginning of Jesus' ministry on Tishri 10 is legally significant. The baptism of Jesus was the beginning of his ministry, and there was a reason it needed to occur on Tishri 10, the Day of Atonement. So, John the Baptist, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to his baptism, he said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourself, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Now the axe also is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is one of the best ways to dispute uh, dual covenant theology, where some people say that Israel is going to be saved on account of having a special relationship with God. No, John the Baptist clearly told them, don't think to say within yourself, be just because Abraham's our father, that we're special. Because it's easy for God to raise up children to Abraham. He promised that Abraham would have descendants that number the sands of the sea, the stars of the sky, the dust of the earth, innumerable. Like, it's not difficult for children of the lineage of Abraham to be born, whether it was through Ishmael or Isaac, that is not difficult. And yes, both of those were promised in Genesis 16 and 17 that they would have descendants that were innumerable. So that's not difficult. Um, it is being part of the spiritual seed which saves, which is, is what he says, spiritual seed through Christ. He says, Now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart him that hath none. He that hath meat, let him do likewise. This is the love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus in Matthew 22 was asked, What are the two greatest, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. Then came also the publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you, or collect from people no more than what you are specifically due. The soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one and mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, 
He will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner and the chaff. He will burn with unquenchable fire, which is the importance of understanding that there is no, uh, there is no truth to dual covenant theology, that anyone who is not Christ's will not see the kingdom. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved to see the kingdom. Prior to this point, it was forward looking to Christ. And now since he has come, it is, is looking to the finished work of Christ. But it has only ever always been about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved of him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added, this, uh, added yet this above all, that he should shut John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And again, we'll talk more about this specifically when we go through Luke 4. The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about thirty years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which is the son of Heli. And this is the rest of the genealogy, which takes us back to Adam, Jesus being the second Adam. And of the tribe of David, which is what this talks about. I am not going to actually read the rest of this chapter because I will do nothing short of botching all of the names. However, if you guys are interested, Genesis 5 gives a, I'm sorry, Matthew 1 gives a genealogy from Abraham to Christ. And Luke 3 gives a genealogy from Jesus back to Adam. So where we're going to stop with this for the purpose of this video, and again, the whole rest of this chapter just takes us back to, to Adam. Uh, verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So Jesus being the second Adam, the implication there is he's the second direct um, giver of life. He's the second direct gift of life from God, meaning that Jesus was directly born of God's spirit, the Holy Ghost. Adam was had the, the spirit of God breathed into his nostrils the, as the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So everyone else uh, except for Adam and Jesus was uh, a reproduction of man, man reproducing after his own kind. We are made in the likeness of Adam, Adam whose name means man. So we are mankind because man came from Adam whose name means man. And as all life was given the command to do in Genesis 1, man reproduced after his own kind, hence mankind. So that is why we have this in nature is because prior to Adam and Eve procreating, he fell and he became sinful. He, he lost his perfection. So we are made in the likeness of Adam. People get this very wrong and say that we're made in the image of God. No, man, Adam, the singular man, was made in the image and likeness of God. And then man, Adam, fell. And as the command was given to Adam to reproduce after his own kind, mankind is reproduced after man who was fallen, sinful Adam. We have to be spiritually reborn and remade in the image of God to close the gap that Adam's sin created. Adam's sin created a physical and a spiritual gap. That's why man had to be removed from the garden is because he could no longer be physically proximate to God. And then the sin created the, the spiritual gap. So our believing in the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, immediately closes the spiritual gap and places us back in communion with God through the indwelling of the Spirit. Who, whose primary purpose is to give life. Our eternal life is housed in the Holy Spirit who is housed in us until our day of glorification, which is the closing of the second gap that our sin created, uh, that, sorry, Adam's sin created between man and God. Our day of glorification closes the physical gap. Our bodies are made glorified and perfect. And immediately after that second of two gaps is closed. We are brought into proximate distance with God again in the heavenly throne of the room by uh, the rapture of the church and Jesus Christ, our bridegroom, coming to take us to the Father's house. Literally, 
as soon as the physical gap, the second of two is closed, because our spiritual gap is already closed. We're just awaiting the time our physical gap is closed. And as soon as it is, we are taken back into proximity with God like Adam was in the garden. So the genealogy from Jesus back to Adam is important to discuss in the concept of the second Adam. Jesus coming to right the wrongs of the first. He became a man to redeem mankind. And he began his ministry when he was about 30 years of age. Now, part of the reason that people believe that the triumphal entry would have occurred in a year other than 32 AD is because they're very bent on 30 AD or 33 AD, thinking that Jesus was born in 1 BC or 3 BC or something like that because there was apparently signs in the heavens in these years. However, that is not accurate. We use the record that we are given and the biblical account of the, the years and the time periods and the day counts and all of that to ascertain 32 AD. I don't care what other sign in the heavens people say existed in other years that they're not right. So we don't care because we only care about what's right. <laughs> So 32 AD, Nisan 10 is the end of his ministry, beginning Tishri 10, 28 AD, Day of Atonement. And we're told that Jesus began to be about 30 years of age when he began his ministry at his baptism. This has a legal implication that we learn about through Numbers 4. Now, Jesus began his ministry about 30 years of age. He was not a Levite. But what do we learn that this 30 years of age has import toward? Well, when we go to Numbers 4, it says in verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi and their families by the house of their fathers from 30 years old and upward unto 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. So, when it says that Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, it's talking about his uh, qualification to enter the priesthood. In the Old Covenant, the sons of Levi, of the, the, the sons of Aaron, according to the tribe of Levi, constituted the priesthood. And they were able to enter work in the priesthood between the years of 30 and 50, between the years of age of 30 and 50. So when it tells us that Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, it's telling us that he was eligible to enter the priesthood. He, however, was not of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. This is where we get into a conversation about Jesus being priest. And his age, his physical years of life were not about 30. His years as the in the eligibility to become a priest were about 30. So let's talk about this because this is going to constitute the rest of the video and where we get from the law to the prophets and Jesus being eligible to enter the office of the priesthood and the conversation about Jesus being after the order of Melchizedek. I had actually intended to press uh, play to keep recording, but it cut off my other video. So this is a part two to Luke three. And this is picking up on the uh, idea, the understanding about Jesus entering the priesthood in Luke 3.23 at about 30 years of age. What we need to do is identify 30 years of age or 30 years from what period. Jesus was not 33, or excuse me, he was not 30 years old when he began his ministry. And he was not 33 years old when he died. This is a very great misconception from Luke 23, believing that Jesus from birth to the entrance of his ministry was about 30 years of age. And this is actually a, uh, <laughs> a point that I have been aware of for years. However, I didn't really understand why I knew this. I just knew that I knew this. 
So now I'm going to expand the conversation and give you a little bit of background to understand why Jesus was not 30 years of age when he began his ministry. He was 30 years from a point when he began his ministry. So in understanding that the about 30 years refers to the time frame under Old Covenant when Levitical sons of Aaron were eligible to enter priesthood from Numbers 4, we understand that this is talking about Jesus entering a priestly capacity. In the Old Testament, there are at least several references to this. I'm going to highlight a few. And this comes from understanding Jesus' role, his title as the branch. Isaiah 11 talks about this. It says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is what happened from his baptism that we discussed earlier in Luke 3, when the Spirit descended from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. We'll discuss this more when we go to Luke 4. Because in Luke 4, Jesus says, The Spirit hath anointed me to do certain things, to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Those are all Day of Atonement type things that, that again we'll talk about in Luke 4, but it, it says, The Spirit hath anointed me. And that is a reference point to the beginning of his ministry when the Spirit of God descended upon him and abode like a dove. So going back to Isaiah 11, it talks about that going to happen. And as a result, it, it anoints him for ministry. But who does it anoint for ministry? The man whose name is the branch. This is very, very important because there is a point in time reference to Jesus becoming the branch in the New Testament. And it was not his birth that anointed him as thus. It is the branch who God anointed for ministry. Jesus became the branch when he was at least several years old. So from his at least several years old specific anointing of the branch, he then becomes eligible for priesthood at about 30 years of age from that point to do all of the things that a priest would do to intercede on behalf of the people, and to pay for their transgressions through his death and to anoint, excuse me, to begin the new covenant um, and invite a whole bunch of other people to participate. The point that I'm making here is that the branch is the, the reference that we need to pay attention to because it was as the branch that he was anointed for priesthood, identified for priesthood, made eligible for priesthood, so that at a point in the future where he reached the age of maturity, According to Numbers 4, he entered the priesthood. So the eligibility for becoming a priest at a point in the future is tied directly to the branch, the assumption of the role of, of the branch. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of Wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, reprove with equity the meek of the earth, and shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Clearly we know who that's talking about. Jesus is the branch. There are two other prophecies about this specifically in Zechariah that I want to take you to. And these are paramount to understanding that the branch is the one who would build the spiritual temple. The branch is the one who is prophesied to be after the order of Melchizedek, uniting the office of king and priest in a single tribe. Jesus is the royal priest, capital R, capital P. And we are the royal priesthood, lowercase r, lowercase p, that serves the royal priest. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 2. We are lively stones built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Why by Jesus Christ? Well, because Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the spiritual temple upon whom we are built as lively stones. The chief cornerstone 
who as the branch is the mediator of the new covenant, the high priest, the royal priest of the new covenant, the branch. Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3 verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest. And this is talking about second temple period. The second temple that would be standing when Jesus came to, in our discussion of Luke 2, <laughs> anoint the most holy with his physical presence. The fulfillment of Haggai 2's prophecy. Uh, talked all about that in Luke 2. So if you missed that conversation, go ahead and check that out. Uh, but Zechariah 2 is talking about the high priest in the second temple about the who would become the high priest of the spiritual temple in the new covenant. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, all in capital letters. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. That is a reference to the, the sevenfold spirit of God, the Holy Ghost that rested upon him, with the seven attributes listed in Isaiah 11 that I just read. These are Revelation 4, seven lamps of burning fire before the throne, and Revelation 5, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So the branch is a stone that will have seven eyes, which is the sevenfold spirit of God. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So this is a reference to Jesus as the branch, the servant of God who will bring peace to Israel eventually. Specifically, though, in Zechariah 6 is the, the prophecy I want to take you to because this lays it out for us that Jesus, as the branch, was prophesied to build the spiritual temple. So he could not have a ministry that led to a death, that led to payment of sin under the old covenant and he, an institution of the new covenant if he did not assume the title by which he is prophesied to do these things. Thus, uh, Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place. Here is the tie to where I'm getting to to the assumption of the role of the branch is pinpointed precisely to Matthew 2, 23. That is when Jesus became who he needed to become to later, about 30 years later, assume a role as priest to intercede on behalf of the people and to three and a half years after that point die for the sins under a covenant which no longer exists and institute a new covenant upon which he would be the chief cornerstone of the spiritual temple and build us up as lively stones. It is central to understanding the timeline of Christ and how all of this fits together to understand that all of this was done as the branch. And when did he become the branch? Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place. And he shall build the temple of the Lord, spiritual temple. He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. He shall sit and rule upon his throne. He shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. This is the capital R, capital P, royal priest. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Luke 3.23, Jesus entering his ministry is the assumption of the role of a priest for the purpose of interceding for the people, which again we'll talk about in Luke 4, why the Day of Atonement, Tishri 10, 28 AD, but Tishri 10 specifically, why that was the day that he began his ministry and all of the implications thereof. Now when we talk about Jesus uniting the office of king and priest in one, this is Hebrew 7's conversation about Jesus being after the order of Melchizedek, king and priest of the Most High God. In the Old Covenant, the tribe of Levi held the uh, the priesthood, and the tribe of Judah held the kingship. Jesus changed all that. This is one of the those things where the Old Covenant and New Covenant have counterparts, but there is no crossover between them, other than the kingship will always be held by Judah. But the priesthood moved from Levi to Judah after the power of an endless life, which means it's never going back. 
So let's look at Hebrews 7 to understand why there is a uniting of the office of king and priest in a single person under the banner of the man whose name is the branch who was prophesied to grow up out of his place. Nazareth. What we will come to learn is that the Hebrew word for branch is Nazareth, which in the Greek New Testament translates to the Nazarene, which is why Matthew 2.23 is paramount to understanding this timeline. But before we get there, let's talk about the man whose name is the branch and what the uniting of the office of king and priest per Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, aka after the order of Melchizedek, means. Hebrews 7.1 for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. That's Genesis 14. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, which is also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. That's talking about Melchizedek. Jesus being after the order of Melchizedek means that those same things apply to him. Then it talks about considering how great Melchizedek was, that Abraham re uh, recognized him as greater and paid tithes to him, and that Levi recognized him as greater also by default because Levi was still in the loins of Abraham, which means that Levi needs to recognize someone greater than Levi, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 11 of Hebrews 7 says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed by Jesus right here on Tishri 10, 28 AD, when Jesus entered ministry as the priest, but not from Levi. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity also a change of the law, which would happen on Passover three and a half years later. For he of whom these things are spoken, Jesus, pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is why it is important to understand that Jesus was prophesied to do all of these things as the branch. All of these prophecies that I've just read you in the Old Testament relate to Jesus as the branch. It doesn't call him the Son of God or the Son of Man or Lord or anything. It calls him the branch. So the identification of Jesus as eligible for ministry at about 30 years of age is as the branch. This is where we go to Matthew 2 for context because it tells you place and time specific when Jesus became the branch in order so that he could grow up out of his place to later assume the role of a priest to intercede for the people at about 30 years of age, which was when, according to the law, eligibility was reached, Numbers 4. So Matthew 2, it talks about Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the time of Herod. And when the wise men came to visit Herod, told him, you know, the king of the Jews, and Herod got a little bit jealous, and decided to try to kill all of the babies who were two years of age and younger. This means that the wise men did not get to, to Jerusalem to see Jesus when he was a baby. He was a toddler by then. Took him a little bit of time. Uh, when the wise men left, they, well, they went back and Herod got mad. So let's pick up the story in Matthew, six, uh, Matthew 2, 16. Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then which was fulfilled, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they were not. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. 
he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So that is when Jesus became the branch. After the couple of years that elapsed from his birth to the killing of the children to the death of Herod, and an angel came to Joseph in a dream, told him it was okay to take, it was safe to go back to Nazareth in Galilee and to raise his child. They took the long way around. So here's where we come to more information about the timeline. We back up. So here's the end of Jesus' ministry, and here's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Tishri 10, 28 AD. Jesus was about 30 years of age. So we're going to plot back to some years in BC to make Jesus old enough to have been about two years of age when Herod decided to kill the children. Herod died, according to the historical record, in Nisan of 4 BC. Now there are people who say, no, he died in 3 or he died in 1 BC. And those are people who would try to, to plot the crucifixion of Christ in 30 or 33 AD as according to the signs in the heavens. And I have at great length told you that according to the historical record and according to the biblical record, this is what works. 32 AD. Doesn't matter about whatever signs in the heavens people try to make fit. 32 AD. Nisan 10 of 32 AD is what matches. And it matches with the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, who came six, year, six months before Jesus. So this is all talked about in part one, or if I can get these two, uh, I can get these to make one single video. <laughs> Earlier in this video, I talked about this. However, Herod died in Nisan of 4 BC. He had children under two years of age, or, or up to two years of age, slain. So that means that Jesus was born at least uh, a year, year and a half prior to. Now, Herod died in Nisan of 4 BC, which means, and Jesus was born in Tishri, Tishri 15. We discussed this in Luke 2, and I have other charts besides to talk about when Jesus was born. Jesus was born on Tishri 15, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the one solemn assembly in that feast. And the eighth day assembly is tacked on to the end of the Feast of Tabernacles to foreshadow the circumcision of Christ when he became a seed of Abraham. Because verily he took not on himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And according to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 17, and also written into the law in Leviticus 12 too, males were required to be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. So that is what the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles and the eighth day assembly point to is the birth of Christ and the circumcision of Christ respectively. Jesus was born in Tishri 15, and he was probably about a year and a half old. He couldn't have been two years old precisely when Herod died because he was born in a different month than Herod died in. So it's likely that Jesus was a year and a half old and that Herod had all babies up to two years of age killed as overkill, obviously. Um, so Jesus is born probably right here, which would be in... Tishri of 6 BC. Herod died in Nisan of 4 BC, a year and a half later. So if it took them six months to go back to Israel, it could have taken them anywhere between six months and a year and a half to go back to Israel. Because that is when we are told precisely that when they came to Nazareth, it was spoken that it might be fulfilled, uh, that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So whether it was six months later or up to a year and a half later, that is when Jesus became the branch. That is the point by which you start counting his eligibility for the priesthood to become an interceder, to unite the office of king and priest, and to build a spiritual temple, all of which he was prophesied to do as the branch. He becomes the branch in either Tishri of 3 or Tishri of 2 BC. When you count from that, Tishri of 3 BC puts him at 30 years of age, right here. 
about 30 years of age from assuming that title and he would turn 31 five days later on Tishri 15th. If you say, no, it took a year and a half for them to come back to Nazareth after Herod died, then it puts him at 29 years of age, five days before his 30th birthday. That is how you calculate the about 30 years. It's not from birth. It's from the assumption of the role as the branch. So you have to go back to when Herod died. They came back to Israel after that. And that, when they came back to Nazareth, was when he assumed the role of the branch. And as the branch, he was prophesied to do these things. So you calculate your about 30 years of age from assumption of the role of the branch to entry into the ministry as the priest. If it was six months later, he was 30, five days before turning 31. If you count a year and a half, he was 29 uh, years from that date, five days before turning the age of 30. That really isn't as important as understanding that it was the assumption of the role of the branch that kicked off all of this eligibility and why Luke 3.23 says about 30 years of age from coming back to Israel to being identified as the Nazarene, which is the Old Testament prophecies as the branch. So this is how we look at all of this stuff and we calculate all of the years. Luke 3 is our double check system and it is the way that we can identify for certain which years things happened, how old Jesus was. Jesus' age isn't specifically important. It is understanding which years things happened and uh, pinpointing with specificity what the timeline actually is. But that is what Luke 3.23 is all about, is it's tied to the branch. And the branch is tied to Matthew 2.23, which is after Herod died and they came back to Israel to, sell, uh, to settle in Nazareth. Because Nazareth is the, Nazareth is the branch. So, if you guys have any questions at all, let me know. We have a lot to go through when we go through Luke 4 also. <laughs> uh, these are very information heavy chapters in Luke. Uh, but as always, I know I'm throwing a lot at you guys, but if you do have any questions, just let me know. Having said that, I will wish you all a wonderful day. Take care.